All right, so <clears throat> this is what you're going to be using for your next homework assignment. All right, so I'm just I'm going to give this to you now at the beginning of uh, the beginning of class while everybody is still relatively fresh and paying attention, um, just to make sure that everybody gets all components of this right. Right. Um, one thing I do want to say about the first homework assignment, um, a couple of you were kind of missing part of it, but um, you guys were a first for me since I started teaching here. This is the first class I've ever had in which everybody actually turned in the first homework <laughs> assignments. So good for you. Please, please, please keep that up. This is also the first class the first composition two class that I've had where for the first three sessions everybody was here. So please keep that up as well, right? Um, over at least in terms of diligence, you guys are doing great. So, uh, right. So this piece that I've given here, so this is part of the preface uh, to uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. How many of you are familiar with the Lord of the Rings, at least the book or the stupid movies? Okay, one or the other, right? So what I want you to do with this, what you're gonna do is write two summaries. Right, operative word here being two, right? Remember, two summaries. Right, the first one, is going to be a general summary of the text. Essentially, what you're going to do right, is going to imagine that I'm asking you what a hobbit is. And you need to put into your own words from that document, right? What the most important things I need to know is if I want to understand, or what I, if I want to understand what, the, what a hobbit is, right? Make sense? Everybody get that? All right. Tell me what I need to know about hobbits. Assuming, of course, someone really needs to know anything about hobbits. Um, part two is going to be a focused summary. What you're going to do is look for some specific theme or idea in the piece and track it, right? Describe it to me in your own words. It's some specific aspect of hobbitness to focus on, right? First summary is going to be just general, what is a hobbit? Second is going to be, I'm going to zero in on some interesting aspect of hobbitness and describe that in more detail, right? All of this is going to be put into your own words. Each of these is to be 250 words, right? Not 250 words total, two separate 250 word summaries. Do you want them to be on separate pages or do you want them to be both on one page? As long as they're clearly separated from each other, I don't really care. Um, it is actually often easier for me if you submit things as one document, um, just because then I don't have to keep flipping back and forth in the document viewer, but I don't really, if you don't do that, it's okay, right? If it's easier for you to submit it as two separate documents, fine, you know, have fun, what the hell, right? But uh, yeah, so long as you clearly separate for me which of these is which, right? Make sure that you do both parts, and make sure that both parts are 250 words, right? Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, the basic idea here, right, the basic point of this 
is to figure out how to be selective with information. Right? How to read a piece of text and try to boil it down to what the most important things in it to understand are. Right? And how to get down even from that to even more minute detail. Because it's out of detail that you're really going to be making meaning. Right? So to that end, um, we're going to start with a reading exercise today. I am going to give you a passage from Jonathan Swift's novel, Gulliver's Travels. And you are going to answer for me two questions about it. Right? The first question, I want you to tell me what animal this describes. It is a real animal. Secondly, I want you to tell me whether the narrator seems to know what the animal is. Right? Does he seem to know what it is that he's looking at? And in both cases, right, I want you to provide evidence, I want you to provide details that justify your answer. Right? Everything has to be backed up with evidence here. So take, um, let's see, you know, take 10 minutes. Read this over very, very carefully. Go over it multiple times if you have to. And try to come up with answers to these questions, right? As soon as you have, you, as soon as you think you have an answer to either question, feel free to say so and to justify it, right? Even if it's, you know, even if you do so before the 10 minutes is up. But yeah, just make sure that you are reading carefully and accounting for every piece of evidence here. Also, if you are already familiar with this passage and you know what the answers are, then do not spoil this for others, okay? All right, so go ahead, get started. Let me know when you think you, uh, you know what the answer is. Sneak in here and grab that. Everybody can read this, right? I don't need to turn off the light. And if there's an unfamiliar word, then just you know, feel free to ask me what it means. What's frizzled mean? Frizzled? Frizzy, yeah. Kind of like uh, crinkly. Well, it says frizzled and others length, so I think length is being like long. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and like long and kind of thin. What's that? Is it a skunk? Why do you think it's a skunk? Um, it says like it has a rigid hair going on its back, you know, that one stripe going on the back of the back. Uh huh. And then, um, let me find the person. Um, it says they use the anus to protect and defend themselves, you know, that's right. Uh, does it actually say they use their anuses to defend the themselves? <laughs> 
Right. No, it's just a, this, there, there's a tuft of hair on the butt. Oh. That's so to defend them when they sit down, right? Oh, I love this. Also, um, do these animals have hair in places other than the ones noted sort of up here? So we've got hair on their heads and breasts. They have beards and a ridge down their backs. Do they have hair elsewhere on their bodies? Yeah, but the, but a skunk is hairy all over, right? Um, is it a sloth? A what? A sloth. A sloth? Why do you think it's a sloth? Um, I don't know. It's talking. Um, it says that they climb high trees mm -hmm. and they have long extended claws. Um, that's not all I have. Do s <laughs> but sloths are hairy all over too, right? Oh, I didn't know and do sloths often spring and bound and leap with prodigious agility? Yeah, that's kind of confused In fact, yeah, so sloths don't do a whole hell of a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick. What makes you say it's a baboon? Uh, baboons don't actually have hair in their body. Yeah. 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 Okay, so bald butt, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And also are multicolored and they do leap and jump with my parents. They do. But they're hairy in more places than are listed here. Right? They don't typically have beards. And if we look at the bottom here, right, the hair of both sexes was of several colors, brown, red, black, and yellow. Is that true of a baboon? It, no, they're, they're, they all have the same color fur, basically. Yeah, Jackson. Is it a human? Why do you think it's a human? Because, I mean, it describes their heads and breasts are covered with thick hair, like chest hair. And then they have beards mm -hmm. and uh, hair on their backs and their legs and their feet. Mm -hmm. but their hands is bare. And uh, climb trees. We can, yes, we're capable of that. Uh, fingernails, mm -hmm. birds, and claws. Yeah, if you don't clip your nails, right, they <laughs> become very claw like. Um, females are smaller than males. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that we do have several different types and colors of hair, right? Um, yeah, Jackson is right. This is a human being. Swift calls the creature a Yahoo, but it's a human. Yeah, but what he's describing is a human being. So the second question here: Does the narrator seem to you to be aware of what he's looking at? Does he seem to know what? It, why, why do you think he's not aware of what it is? Yeah, generally, yeah, generally when you see another person, you don't break down their physical characteristics in this particular way, right? You don't necessarily classify that person according to various animal characteristics, right? So it's clear that he thinks what he's looking at is some sort of beast, yeah? Right. He's using sort of almost like the language of a zoologist here who's encountered a new species. Uh huh. Or one against which I naturally conceive so strong an antipathy. If you have an antipathy towards something, what does that mean? Is, oh, there's an emotional connection. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it repulses you, right? Something you have an antipathy to is something that disgusts you. Right? Yeah, Jackson. What is the narrator? The narrator, the narrator is a human being. Okay. In fact, the narrator is an Englishman by the name of Lemuel Gulliver, who is a ship's doctor um, who keeps getting stranded on weird islands. And this particular island is inhabited by two species. Um, a group of sort of hyper intelligent but um, completely unemotional horses called Winims. And these creatures, which are called Yahoos. And the Yahoos um, are basically used as kind of uh, labor animals by the Winims, right? So, kind of reversing the way human beings use horses, right? On this island, the horses are the smart and civilized ones. The Winims and the Yahoos 
pull their carts for them and you know do their plowing and all that right so one thing that this does here right part of the way this works is by setting up and then destroying kind of reformulating a particular binary opposition. Right? Now, do you remember what we mean by binaries? What, what, what we're talking about? We talk about a binary. It's like two opposites. Yeah, it's an opposed pair, right? Two things that we tend to define in terms of each other, right? So, what's the obvious binary in this, right? Between our narrator and these creatures he's looking at. Think of it in these terms. Like, what what is he? And what does he think they are? Yeah, he, he, he's human, right? He's a human being. And he thinks he's looking at a group of animals, right? So the binary we're starting with is a human-animal binary. But as we figure out what the creature really is, right? Through careful reading and through careful attention to the text, does this binary still hold up? What this text is doing is, is doing is reminding us that human beings are animals, right? And so, what we're really looking at here is a diff is a sort of dichotomy between a civilized human. Right, a human who has had, I don't necessarily want to say the benefits, um, but you know, the benefits of education, civilization, um, that sort of thing, right? And another group of humans are sort of in a state of nature, right? So we have a sort of civilization versus primitivism binary. And these human beings in a completely uncivilized state are unrecognizable as such to their fellow creature, right? So one of the reasons I wanted to do this uh, at the beginning of class here was to sort of make a quick point about uh, reading, right? This is a composition class. So yes, you know, this is focused on writing. But most of your writing is going to come from things that you have to read. And we're used to just trying to read things quick as quickly as possible to extract some kind of main idea. But if you read this quickly and just kind of skim it for the gist, are you actually going to get the main idea? it's going to go right over your head, right? It's not immediately obvious what this paragraph is about or what forces are opposed to each other here, right? Or what, you know, what's at stake in the paragraph. So what you need to be doing as you read, right? The first major thing you need to do is slow down and develop an eye for meaningful detail. Now, there are a couple of ways in which we do this. One way is sort of, sort of just simply by paying attention to words themselves, right? Now, here, what we had to do was just sort of look for a pattern and find a creature that fit the particular pattern, right? What creature has all of these characteristics? It's not always going to be quite that simple, but you can figure out a lot simply by paying attention uh, to the levels of language and the kinds of language that an author uses. So I am going to put three words on the board, and you are going to tell me if they all mean the same thing. They all mean the same thing.
Yeah, I mean, they all refer to the same body function, right? So how are they different? The way that you perceive them, perceive Okay, yeah, some of it is, yeah, the social perception, right? One of these words is considered vulgar in common usage, right? It's considered impolite. Another is essentially a biological technical term. And the third is a polite euphemism, which doesn't actually refer to the thing itself, but rather to the parts of your body that move to produce the thing, right? So why do we have three different ways of saying in English pretty much the same thing? What other uses can we make of some of these words? If I get out of bed in the morning and stub my toe, does it make sense for me to shout, oh, defecate? <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it'd be, that, would, that would be ridiculous, right? Right, oh shit would be the more appropriate response. Now, why is it that we use these words so differently? A lot of this has to do with the history of the English language and the waves of migrations and invaders um, really in England in the Middle Ages, right? Does anybody know what happened in England in the year 1066 that changed the way we speak and the development of the language? Battle of Normandy. Uh, Battle of Hastings, I think is what you're thinking oh, of, okay, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah. yeah, essentially what we're talking about is what's called the Norman Conquest of England, right? So the Normans were from Normandy, of course, right, in northern France. And they came in and swept out the existing English aristocracy. And so suddenly, the people who mattered in England, the important people, the cultural elites, all spoke French. The only people who were left speaking English were commoners, were peasants, right? So we consider a word like shit. Like shit is actually one of the oldest words in the English language. Right? It comes from right, what scholars call Anglo-Saxon and what is more commonly referred to as Old English. And in Anglo-Saxon, it has no negative connotations. Right? It is just the word for what it describes. Our polite euphemism here comes from French. Indeed, a lot of our polite euphemisms for things come from French, as do most of our cooking words, most of our fashion words, most of our military terms, and um, a lot of our legal terms, right? Basically, anything that would have been associated with the medieval elite culture in the English language comes from French. So. This one in the middle here comes from Latin. How would that have gotten there? Where would we have absorbed that from? Who would have been speaking Latin in England in the Middle Ages? The Pope. Well, well the, the priesthood. Well, yes, yes, yeah. yes. The, the Pope probably wouldn't have been in England. No. But, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, the Catholic Church, right? Um, this is the official liturgical language of the Catholic Church who pretty much had total control over the educational system in Europe in the Middle Ages, right? So Latin was the language of scholars and of educated people. And so we still take most of our scientific and technical terms from Latin, right? So this is why we have three different words for the same thing, right? And this is how certain words become favored in language and you know how certain words become vulgar, right? Like there's nothing inherently wrong with the word shit, right? If I tap dance up here for 45 minutes and you're saying shit, shit, shitty, shit, 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 right? Nothing's gonna happen to me. Like, I'm not gonna get struck by lightning. Um, you know, no one's gonna come in here and punish me, right? I should probably be fired because it would be a really irresponsible thing to do as an educator. I'd be wasting your time. But, <clears throat> you know, the only reason we regard this particular word as vulgar is because it was spoken by peasants. Right? So it sometimes helps to know a little bit about 
the history of a word when we're thinking about how we use particular words, right? Now, to go alongside this, all words essentially have two different kinds of meaning, right? Every word has a denotation, or a couple of different denotations in the case of some words, and a set of what we call connotations, right? So the denotation is just the pure semantic meaning of the word, right? Just the, the dictionary definition, right? The literal meaning of the word. So if I give you a word like rose, right, what is the literal semantic meaning of that word, right? Red flower. Yeah, a red flower, right, grows on a bush, fragrant, has thorns, right? That would be the denotation of rose, right? Now, connotation, which is what we're often going to be reading for, is instead a range of associated ideas that we attach to particular words, right? So, if we use the word rose, I mean, yes, it calls up a fragrant red flower that grows on a bush and has thorns, right? But what other ideas do we associate with the rose? Okay, yeah. The big one, right, generally speaking, is love and sexuality, right? The rose is a popular love gift. What else? What other ideas do we associate with the rose? Pain or heartbreak. Yeah. Well, the thorns. Pain, in heart, life. yeah. Pain, heartbreak, even a little bit of danger, right? Right. Because of the thorns. Yes, good. Pain and heartbreak. What else? What other ideas do we associate with the rose? Even things that are related to these other two notions. Death. Why, why death? That's an interesting one. <laughs> when, when someone passes away, like normally you send the family flowers, and sometimes it's roses. Or but it's usually lilies, right? Li yeah, lilies are typically the, like the, the funeral flower, right? So that would be a connotation that the lily carries. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah, marriage. Beauty, now the combination of beautiful flower and sharp thorns in the Middle Ages combined to make the, the rose seem the perfect representation of virgin saints, right? Beautiful but untouchable. And so it also came to carry connotations of purity, right, which seemed to run counter to the notions of sexuality that we also associate with the rose, right? But yeah, the rose was also a sort of common image for uh, the Virgin Mary, and indeed um, in Dante's Divine Comedy, the, the great uh, medieval Italian poem, um, the last part of it in which it describes heaven, right, heaven is described as being sort of shaped like the folds of a rose, whereas purgatory is a mountain, and hell is a pit. So we have all of these associated ideas, right, that we attach to this particular word. And you, when you're reading, you are going to be trying to pick up on these particular associated ideas, right? Try to read for connotation and not just denotation. And oftentimes that's going to require you to look at things in context, right? Because one thing about language, right? Words only have meaning in context. Right. It's useless to know 
all the dictionary definitions of a particular word without understanding the context in which it's being used, right? So one exercise we can do to try to tease out both some of the connotations of words and using context to help us understand um, is paraphrase. Does anybody, does everybody understand what I mean by paraphrase? What, is, what does it mean to paraphrase something? Summarize. Not quite, right? When you're summarizing, usually what you're doing is taking a fairly large chunk of text and boiling it down to its essentials, right? Yeah, a paraphrase is taking a shorter piece of text, or maybe a single sentence, and replacing the key words in it with synonyms while retaining the structure of the original sentence, right? So paraphrase typically doesn't work. Like, you couldn't easily or quickly paraphrase this, right? You could summarize it, and I expect you to summarize it, but you could only paraphrase individual sentences of this, right? So what paraphrasing does is sort of makes us alert to the ways in which particular sets of words are interacting with each other and reveals to us the logic behind the way a particular sentence is constructed. So I'll give you an example. This is one of my favorite Oscar Wilde quotes. Thought is not catching. So we have at least one word in this sentence that can mean multiple things, right? Catching can be either a kind of passive verb, right? I am catching the ball. Or it can be an adjective for something that spreads through contact, right? So in context here, which is it probably? It yeah, it's probably an adjective, right? So what I'm going to try to do here is find <coughs> three ways to restate this while maintaining the basic structure of the original sentence, right? So. Mental activity is not infectious. Ideas are not contagious. Rumination, that's a good one, is not trendy. So <clears throat> breaking this down like this shows us ways in which Wilde is conceiving of what thought is like, right? They show us sort of how the statement works here, like what he's trying to compare thought to. On the one hand, what do we see about the words infectious and contagious, right? What do we usually associate those with? Disease. With disease, yes. So, on the one hand, Thought is being described as not being like an illness, right? Where you, you cough in your hand and then shake somebody else's hand and it moves on to that next person, so on and so forth, right? It doesn't spread by coughing on people. It doesn't spread through just simple physical contact, right? But what about this other word here, trendy? Right? Now, trendy is something that is also kind of near synonym for catching, right? Trend, some, a trend also spreads through contact. Right, say, you know, um, your friend buys a cool pair of shoes. It's like, oh, I like those shoes, right? I'm going to buy a pair myself. Then people see you wearing those shoes. Like, oh, those are nice shoes. I'm going to go buy a pair, right? And just sort of through seeing other people wearing a thing or doing a thing, other people start doing it, right? So the same kind of metaphor here where simile works, 
right? That thought is neither like a disease, nor is it like a popular trend that simply spreads from person to person, right? So how is he then thinking of thought or mental activity? How does it not spread? Okay, not through example, right? Not through touching people. Not through simply seeing other people do a thing. So what do those things all have in common? They're passive. They're passive. And they're social, right? So thought does not spread passively, and it does not spread socially, right? Thought, mental activity, rumination, these are all private activities, right? So what he's saying here, right, is that thought is kind of something that you have to do on your own, right? You're not just going to pick up ideas simply by being in contact with other people who have them, right? In order to think, you have to maintain some level of independence from the crowd. Make sense? Everybody see how I did this? Okay, good, because I want you to do something similar with a sentence that is slightly longer and perhaps a little bit harder. So I have taken this quote from a particularly excellent old episode of Doctor Who. The very powerful and the very stupid have one thing in common. They don't alter their views to fit the facts. They alter their facts. They alter the facts to fit their views. Now, you don't have to replace every word in this with something else, right? Just the key words, right? So nouns, ver nouns, verbs that are not forms of to be, um, adverbs, adjectives, right? Did you say this was from a recent episode? Oh, no, no. This is from uh, an episode from the 70s. Oh, okay, I was going to say. Didn't sound like anything recent at all. No, no, it's from one of the old Tom Baker episodes. All right, so take five minutes and try to rephrase this at least three times, maintaining the original structure of the sentence, right? Just replace those key words. Keep at this, I'll be back in just a minute.
two minutes. Before we start breaking this down, um, really try to keep this in mind as a good rule of thumb for dealing with evidence too, right? Think back to the exercise we did at the beginning of class, right? You can't get the answer right if you don't take all of the evidence into account, right? If you're only looking at isolated pieces of evidence, then you're getting the answer wrong. You're not guessing the proper animal. So whenever you are look, you know, dealing with any particular kind of problem, make sure that you are looking at the whole fabric of fact here, right? Okay. So can somebody give me a synonym for very? Extremely. Extremely. Okay, good. All right. Extremely. Can somebody give me another synonym for very? Highly. Pardon? Highly. Highly. Good. <clears throat> And one more. Incredibly. So all of the words we've chosen here are basically intensifiers, right? So this su su suggests to us, right, that the level of power or stupidity that we're dealing with is out of the ordinary, right? That it's not just ordinarily powerful or ordinarily stupid people who make these kinds of mistakes. It's people who are somehow intensely powerful or stupid, right? So give me some synonyms then for powerful. Strong. Okay, strong. Give me another. Influential. Influential. One more. Mighty. Mighty, okay. So note here, right, that two of the synonyms you've chosen relate to physical strength, right? But the one in the middle here is a more subtle form of power, right? One who has influence over others. So we see here that we're not just looking at one particular kind of power. It's not just people who will physically force facts to fit into a particular pattern. It's people who may try to do so or more soon do so more subtly as well, right? So thinking about powerful in these terms shows us the multifaceted nature of that particular word, right? That it covers act rather a lot of ground. All right, good. What about stupid? Dumb. Okay, dumb. Ignorant. Ignorant. Mentally impaired. Mentally impaired, okay. Okay, so all of these indicate someone who don't think too good, right? So this is a much more clear 
kind of distinction than what we get with powerful. Powerful is much more broad, right? We come up with a bigger range of types of synonyms for that. Um, stupid is rather narrow. And some of these aren't, I mean, there's no such thing as a true synonym anyway, right? We, language tends to retain only words that it needs. And we say that, you know, stupid and ignorant often don't mean quite the same thing, right? Ignorant often refers to a correctable lack of knowledge. Um, but yeah, so yeah, at any rate, we're talking solely about mental capacity here, right? Okay, good. Thing. Give me synonyms for three, uh, give me three synonyms for thing. Okay, concept. Goal. Similarity. So, um, would, that, would that really be a, a, a synonym for thing, though? I think trait would probably be closer. But again, yeah, thing is a word that is broad enough, again, that it's hard to come up right. with the real synonym. So we have to think in context here, right? Notice that most of the synonyms that you guys have shouted out here are related to ideas in some way, right? So we can see from context, right, we're talking about ideas. Good, okay. In common. Alike. Alike, okay. Give me two more. Similar. Similar. The same. The same. <laughs> okay. And that doesn't quite maintain the structure of the sentence, but it's basically like, okay, this this is fairly easy, right? Okay, two ideas and two ideas. This is shared notions. All right. Alter. Fix. Okay. Fix. Change. Change. And can you come up with one more? Renew, okay. Right. Renew and refresh, right? You don't like what's on the web page? Just refresh and see what. Okay, so fix, change, renew. Let me put that in two places. Views. Okay, opinions. Ideas. Perspectives. Perspectives. And facts. So <clears throat> what this shows us as we take this apart and we sort of substitute words, right, is that most of us are reading this in terms of mental activity that tries to take in things that are hard and fast rules or truths, right? And that either people who are cognitively impaired or people who are so influential or strong they don't have to care, right, can try to fix reality, right, can try to change reality to suit their own needs or their own opinions, right? And does this seem to regard this as a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing, right, yes. These levels of intensity, I think, sort of demonstrate some of that. So basically, like what this is, or what paraphrase is, is a good tool for understanding how language works on the sentence level, right? And for seeing how words relate to each other, how ideas relate to each other on the sentence level. Now, we did talk a little bit about summary as well, which is what I'm expecting you to do for this homework assignment. 
that will be right. The, the thing on the Aztec, the, the Aztecs is due tonight, right? I see some of you have already submitted something. Um, and then the thing, like this thing, the summary is due Thursday night. So <clears throat> essentially a summary is a description, right? In your own words of some other sort of image or piece of text. So we're gonna do a little bit of practice with this, with an image, right? I am gonna give you an image to look at, and I want you to write in about 250 words or so, just get as close as you can within the time, right? As detailed a description of what I'm showing you as possible. Once this comes up, right, remember what you're going for here is coverage, right? Pretend that you have to describe this image to someone who can't see it. And so try to say as much about it as you can in 250 words, right? So whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started.
take two more minutes. It's okay if you don't make it all the way to 250. Just you know, to do the best you can. Okay, so when I ask you to describe a whole object like this in, you know, 250 words or less or seven minutes or less, right, whichever, when I give you that kind of limit, what's the most challenging thing about that? What's the difficulty? Yeah, coverage is a problem, right? How do I fit everything I need to say about this? into a limited space. So what's the thing you need to do to solve the coverage problem? Yeah, one thing you could do is use broader terms, right? But then you just get a kind of vague and fuzzy picture of what's there, right? So it's actually generally going to be a better idea to prioritize. Right. Take those details that you think are the most important focus on those. Now, a general summary like this is often not going to be a particularly great way to get ideas for a longer paper. But it's a necessary first step because in order to analyze the parts, you need to see how they all fit together in the big picture, right? So what I want you to try to do now in another 250 words, if you can, right? I want you to focus on some specific part of this image to describe in as much minute detail as you can, okay? All right, so go ahead, get started. Just zero in on some part of this that you think is interesting, right? Whether it's one of the figures or the clothes the people are wearing or the background, or the relationship between the two figures, right? Just some single aspect of the picture. Whatever you want to be, whatever you think is, whatever you think is most interesting about it, or most puzzling. Oftentimes, we write not because we're trying to, not because we know something, because we're trying to figure something out.
it is you're looking at, just try to break it down into minute detail. Be as specific as you can. two minutes.
Okay, you can stop. Give your arms a rest. So how many of you were able to generate almost as much material by focusing on something specific as you were by talking about the whole thing? Okay, yeah, that's rather a lot of you, right? Yeah, you can, get, you can get a lot just by zeroing in on one particular aspect of a text or an image, right? So what did you guys choose to focus on? What did you, uh, what did you pick? Clothes. The clothes? Okay, now what did you, what did you say about the clothes? And they were judged for warm weather and not described like what specific type of each uh, item. Okay. And what conclusions did you come to about these people based on their clothes? What could you come to about these people based on their clothes? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't going to say they were poor because they don't look good <laughs> or wealthy. Okay. So they, so they look neither rich nor poor. But you see, like the, the point I'm trying to get is like you could use this summary, right, as a springboard for generating further ideas about um, these particular figures. Now, you focused on the statue, Grace. What did you say? What did you say about the statue? Can you tell who the statue is? Uh, who the statue of? Okay, it's it's a statue of Benjamin Franklin. And the position of the statue is also interesting relative to like to the two figures here. He's looming in the background over them, right? But also slightly behind them. Yeah, Nick. Okay. I mean, it's actually San Francisco. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, they're in a city park. Yep. But yeah, the, <clears throat> we're running out of time, so not to belabor this, right? But the basic point is, right, like, when you want to do general, genuine analysis that generates ideas, right, what you need is that second summary, right, to actually examine something in detail. But in order to get that second summary, Right, in order to figure out what's important enough to focus on, you have to do that first summary that takes in everything, right? And looks at how things are related to each other. Okay, um, so we are about out of time. I will let you go, um, and we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>